Someone has said that one of the most amazing things about spaceflight is its ability to dazzle us. And it's exactly what Starship has done in Flight 3. Beyond a simple test, the Thursday flight is an epic visual feast for the space lover. This is also an opportunity for a large national space agency like NASA to think about itself. What SpaceX just did with Starship Flight 3 made NASA embarrassed. Perhaps the SpaceX fan in particular and the space community in general cannot forget the moment of true amazement at T plus 46, 20 into the flight. It's when Starship descended an altitude of 100 kilometers and its flaps began heating up during its first re-entry attempt. For a couple of minutes, we were treated to unprecedented views of glowing plasma around Starship's surface. The craft had been due to attempt to relight its Raptor engines, which has never been done in space before, for a controlled re-entry to Earth's atmosphere, starting at almost 27,000 kilometers per hour. But this relight part of the mission was skipped by the company, and the craft was subsequently lost. Obviously, these unprecedented views would not have been delivered to us without Starlink, Indeed, this terminal plays an important role in sending signals to satellites in LAO and then sending them back to Earth. This idea has also been applied by NASA for the last 40 years, based on a small constellation of tracking and data relay satellites to communicate with spacecraft, beginning with the space shuttle. Although Starlink is only at low data rates and is dropped as the plasma thickens, its longer connection still enabled the stunning video of re-entry, Thanks to those beautiful videos, people have more faith in a world where rocket launches are as cheap and abundant as airplanes. As we know, SpaceX's initial goal was to develop a low-cost rocket, so they focused on costs and cheap building materials, stainless steel, for example. As a result, the idea of a fully expendable version of Starship for about $100 million is totally feasible. The most expensive component is in the booster with 33 engines inside. So once Super Heavy is reusable, SpaceX will have a rocket that costs about $30 million and lifts 100 to 150 metric tons to low Earth orbit. In the case that Elon Musk wishes to compete with the commercial airline industry, prioritizing cost savings needs to be much more focused. If renowned airlines such as United, Delta, and American heavily rely on international flights as a substantial revenue source, SpaceX also has very creative point-point travel on Earth. Imagine if SpaceX manages to lower the ticket prices for Starship rides to an attractive level. They could potentially disrupt not only the traditional airline industry, but also the logistics sector. At that point, the possibility cargo could be transported 25 times faster than airliners. The logistics industry stands to reap immense benefits from such a groundbreaking capability. Clearly, that dream never comes true for a burning money vehicle like NASA's SLS. Its payload capacity is 95 tons to LEO nearly as much as Starship, but its cost makes any investor hesitate. The given price is $2.2 billion per launch not to mention additional ground systems fees. So it's almost a factor of 100 times more expensive for less throw weight. With such huge costs, it is reasonable for NASA to only consider SLS as a tool for political purposes. In terms of application, Starship is always their focus. It is part of NASA's directive to foster commercial use of space. Congress declared that the general welfare of the United States requires that the administration seek and encourage to the maximum extent possible, the fullest commercial use of space. This led to a $53 million contract between NASA and SpaceX in tipping point contracts awarded in 2020. The contract calls for SpaceX to transfer 11 tons, 10 metric tons, of liquid oxygen between tanks inside a Starship vehicle. Starship's Raptor engines run on super coal liquid oxygen and liquid methane, the tricky concept is known as cryogenic propellant transfer, something never done before in microgravity. Yet again, NASA was shocked by what SpaceX did on Flight 3. An extremely difficult technology never before put into practice was completed for the first time in space. More notably, it was done on a large-scale vehicle like Starship. On its website, NASA paid tribute to Starship's propellant transfer demonstration in space, which will be important for future moon missions run by NASA's Artemis program. With each flight test, 
SpaceX attempts increasingly ambitious objectives for Starship to learn as much as possible for future mission systems development. Lisa Watson Morgan, Human Landing Systems, HLS Program Manager at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama. The ability to test key systems and processes allows both NASA and SpaceX to gather crucial data needed for the continued development of Starship, HLS Watson Morgan added. Few people know that before SLS was born, NASA was interested in developing refueling technology in space. Unfortunately, when Congress directed the agency to build a large rocket based upon space shuttle era technology called the Space Launch System, they also quietly put on the back burner its work. The reason for this is rumored that funding for NASA's efforts to develop so-called propellant depots and the capability to store and transfer cryogenic rocket fuels in orbit was considered a threat to the existence of SLSE's program. The SLS contractors did not like this, and for that reason, we have a vehicle that is costing $2 billion a year to develop. So why not just use that money to buy commercial launches, starting with Falcon Heavy and build an exploration program around existing capabilities? It would likely be quicker and cheaper. Anyway, at least SpaceX Starship can now make NASA's dream come true. The success of SpaceX represents the efforts NASA has made to meet the fullest commercial use of space. Obviously, NASA was not born to compete with any private firm. Its job, instead, is to operate at the envelope, doing the work the market can't support until it becomes supportable by the market. Then NASA expands the envelope and makes the next frontier palatable for the private sector. Every commercial-slash-private sector space company utilizes the research, technology, and lessons that the government agency acquired with blood, sweat, tears, and national treasure. Technology transfer is a big part of this process, but so is the fostering of nascent markets. NASA's commercial cargo and commercial crew programs deliberately emulate tactics that built the commercial air industry a century ago. An aviation manufacturing industry was created in World War I in the U.S., but at the end of the war, the Defense Department canceled almost all of their aviation contracts. This threatens the existence of this industry due to a lack of development costs. The U.S. Postal Service by then was considered a savior as they bought the hardware and then used it itself. However, the reliance on only one consumption source is not basically helpful for economic growth. That's where the Airmail Act of 1925 comes in. Also known as the Kelly Act, it was a key piece of legislation that intended to free airmail from total control by the Post Office Department. In short, it allowed the Postmaster General to contract private companies to carry mail. This encouraged private companies to start air freight businesses and compete for contracts. These mail-carrying flights became regular and scheduled and bright enterprising entrepreneurs came up with the idea of selling tickets for passengers to ride on these aircraft along with the mail. Airplanes became larger and as the industry became established and efficient, the market grew. People became more trusting and tickets became cheaper, making passenger aviation a normal way to travel. Soon, the air carriers were making enough profit from the passengers that they didn't really need to carry the mail to stay in business. Almost a century later, we are in a similar position with commercial space transportation. NASA's current role in this effort is to stimulate the commercial space industry via two efforts, Commercial Orbital Transportation Services, COTS and Commercial Crew Program, CCP. Over the last several years, COTS has provided funds to Orbital Sciences and SpaceX in exchange for them ferrying cargo to the ISS. The hope is that, through these contracts, the U.S. government will stimulate the private space industry so that it can develop to a point at which it will be economically self-sufficient without government involvement. And that just about wraps it up for today's episode. If you want to explore more aspects of the world's most powerful rockets and the world of rockets in general, here is a selection of deeper dive videos for you. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you next time.